my name is Molly Gartland, and I'm the author of The Girl from the Hermitage. Um, joining me today are three other authors. Um, they'll introduce themselves in a moment. Um, we'll have time for questions at the end of our presentation. So if you have any questions, simply put them in the, the Q&A uh, chat. Um, so uh, let's, let's get started. Kwe Mai, can you tell me a little bit about yourself and your fabulous book? Thank you so much, Molly, for organizing this panel and for your kind moderation. Um, I must say first how much I love your novel, The Girl from the Hermitage, and I can't wait to hear you talk about it today. So hi, everyone. Thanks for joining our panel today. Um, my name is Gue Mai. Um, I'm a Vietnamese author. I published um, eight books in Vietnamese language and The Mountains Sing is my first novel in English. Um, so it's an epic account of Vietnam's 20th century history via the lives of four generations of a Vietnamese family. So via the narrations of Grandma Ziu Lan and her granddaughter Huong in the novel, um, you get to experience the impact of major historical events uh, on Vietnam, such as the French colonization, the Japanese invasion, the Great Hunger, the land reform, the Vietnam War, and the subsidized economy period when we live under the American embargo. Um, so the you know this book will enable readers to um, to to experience events that shape Vietnam today why big emerge into our culture, our ways of life, uh, see our scenery, taste our food, and listen to our poetry and language. It took me a lifetime of research, uh, a master in creative writing, and a, as well as a PhD in creative writing to write this novel. And I hope you find it interesting. So let me introduce uh, you to my co-panelist, Deborah. Um, whose deb uh, debut um, novel, the, the Young Survivors, is fabulous. Uh, Deborah, uh, your novel, The Young Survivors, is so important as it documents the experiences of Jewish people in France. Could you tell us about you and your novel? Yes, thank you very much. And first, I'd like to say that your book sounds fascinating, and that is why I love historical fiction, because it is a great opportunity to enjoy a fabulous story, as well as learning about a country that, um, a place that I don't know and a time that I don't know. And that's why I loved Molly's book as well, The Girl from the Hermitage, which I've already read. And I learned so much about Russia, which you'll tell us more about later, but it was, it was, it was really brilliant. And Poppy, obviously your book's only just out, so I haven't had a chance to read it yet. But my book, The Young Survivors, is set in France during the Second World War, and it follows the fate of a Jewish family. Um, and uh, it's kind of like, it starts just before the beginning of the war. So it's a little bit about how they lived um, before the war. And then at the beginning during Nazi occupation of France and later when the parents are arrested and taken away and the five children of this one particular family are left by themselves to fend for themselves and they have a few adventures along the way um, but there's also a tragic end for um, two of the five children and the three the book is told through the voices of the three um, surviving children and I'll explain later but it has a very personal um, connection with me also I had to do a lot of research to um, to be able to write it, I wanted to make sure that it was as accurate as possible because these days um, there is unfortunately um, quite a lot of um, a big Holocaust. Holocaust. <laughs> 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 Oh, quite May. Maybe it's you. Do you want to mute yourself for a minute? Can everybody else hear that? Come on. 
Okay, I've muted her. It was quite May, it was you. You need to keep yourself muted while you're not speaking. Sorry, there was a funny noise. Anyway, sorry. So uh, very briefly, because this is only supposed to be briefly. Yeah, so, so, so the reason behind my book is that there is a lot of Holocaust denial going on at the moment, and I didn't want to fuel that in any way by writing any inaccuracies. So although it is Holocaust uh, historical fiction, it's very closely based on the true story of my own family and everything has been very uh, well um, researched and it has also been endorsed by the Wiener Holocaust Library. So um, as well as getting a great story, um, you're also getting a very important piece of history. Anyway, I'll leave it there for the moment and hand over to my, to my friend and fellow author Poppy to tell us about her book. Thank you very much, Deborah. Um, hello, everybody. My name's uh, Poppy Cooper. And this is my book. It's called The Post Office Girls. Um, and actually it's hot off the presses. It's published by Hodder and Stoughton. And uh, it came out in uh, ebook and audio on Thursday and it's not out in paperback until the 13th of May. So I'm very excited to have just received these um, and to have my hands on them. Um, so it's, uh, it's basically um, about the lives and escapades of the first women um, to work for the Army Post Office um, in World War I. And uh, there was so much post going to and from um, the UK and the various fronts that the normal sorting officers just couldn't cope with it. And what they did was they built a massive great wooden building um, on the Regent's Park in London, the biggest wooden building in the world at the time, they said. Um, and that's where they sorted literally millions, I think it was billions of letters by the end of the war, went out to France, Mesopotamia and, and everywhere else. Um, so, yep, that's what the book's all about. It follows three girls, and I'll tell you a little bit more about it as we go through this particular session. Um, so The Post Office Girls is my first uh, book as Poppy Cooper, but my debut actually came out last year as Kirsten Hesketh. This is it, it's called Another Us. And uh, it's quite different, hence the two different names. This is contemporary uplet, um, and it's been described as a heartwarming, poignant, and funny story about love, family, and Asperger's. So quite different, but for today, I'm Poppy. Um, so that's me, and let me pass you back to Molly yes. to tell you about the fabulous The Girl from the Hermitage. Over to yeah. you, Molly. Um my book it's it's really interesting because i've i've read um young survivors and mountain sting and i haven't i haven't read the the post office girls yet as it's just just had on the shelf um but what's interesting is there's quite a parallel between quay mai's book and mine because it spans a very similar time period um, mine is from the 40s through to modern day uh, but my book is set in Russia. And so it looks at this family um, and how they survived the siege of Leningrad and into the Soviet days and the collapse of the Soviet Union and into present day. Um, the, the main protagonist, she's an artist, so it's quite an arty book. And, and her father was, was a, a, he worked at the Hermitage. Um, so, so it's, it's a little bit of art and it's a little bit of history and, and Russia as well. Um, but yeah, it's great to have this panel because I, I think the books work really, really well together. And, um, so I, I'd like to get into the inspiration, um, behind the book. So why don't we go ahead and start with The Mountain Sing. Uh, I'm going to share screen, so hopefully we won't we won't like suddenly lose everybody. Um, and we're going to start with Kwe Mai, and she is going to tell us a little bit about the inspiration behind her book. Oh, wait, we have to unmute you. Wait. Okay. Um, so, sorry. So, um, my, um, as I said, my novel is an epic account of Vietnam's uh, 20th century history, and it's open with uh, the American bombings of Hanoi in 1972. 
So actually, when I was uh, growing up, um, you know, I was born in the north of Vietnam and grew up in the south of Vietnam. And um, I witnessed how our country and our community, our families were divided, not just by the Vietnam War, but my, by the many historical events. So I wanted to use a Vietnamese family to represent Vietnam and how different, different historical events divide us. And I also have uh, want to uncover untold stories as well. So, um, you know- Hey Mai, sorry, could you, could you speak a little bit louder? People are saying that they can't hear you very well. Oh, I'm sorry. Can you hear me better now? Better. So, um, you know, the purpose of my book is also to document uh, untold stories about Vietnam. For example, today, I just had a piece on the New York Times about the impact of Agent Orange. And, um, you know, the, the pictures you see here on the screen is of the bombings of Hanoi in 1972. So growing up, I had the idea of, of uh, writing a book, um, you know, that documents different historical events, but I didn't know how to open that, that, you know, how to find a key to open the story until one day I was traveling in a car with my friend and he told me the bombings of Hanoi and that when he was 12 years old, he was living with his grandmother and his grandmother protected him from the bombs. So after hearing that story, I went home and I Googled and I found so many images of Hanoi being bombed in 1972. As you can, could see here, many civilian houses were destroyed and many people died and actually, you know, Many people also died from uh, by the bombs that were dropped onto back my hospital. So I was really moved um, looking at the pictures and listening to you know the the broadcast that announced the arrival of the bombers and um, seeing how the people had to run away and jump into the bomb shelter. So this is the opening scene of, of my novel. But you know, throughout the novel, I also uh, talk about other events of our history as well. Thank you. Uh, Deborah, do you yeah. want to tell us a bit about your uh, inspiration? Yeah, do you want to just go to my slide? There we go, lovely. Okay, so um, as I kind of hinted before, my mother was a Holocaust survivor, but um, she never spoke about what, had, uh, what she'd gone through in France. And that was for two reasons. First of all, she was very young at the time. And also she was completely traumatized by, by what she went through. Um, now, so we never spoke about it at home and I, I never asked her about it because I didn't want to upset her. But one day in um, 2006, um, a cousin of mine found a book on the internet and this photograph that you can see here, um, and here I've got a copy of the photograph on a book. She discovered this on the internet and I'm just going to show you that here, I don't know if you can see me um, pointing, pointing this out with my cursor, but basically the, the child in the middle on the back row is my mother. Okay, and this is her twin sister here. So this is my mother. Sorry, Molly, you're copying, you're following me. This is my mother with the short hair and this is her twin sister. And this they, photo- yeah, they, they can't see your cursor. They okay, okay. So my mother is the one in the back row with the short, with the very short hair which we think she, she had her um, head shaved because they had, she had head lice most probably. And that's how they dealt with it in those days. And the one to her left is her twin sister. So my mother's name was Paulette and her twin sister was Annette. And this photograph was taken in 1944 on the steps of an orphanage for Jewish children in um, a suburb just outside Paris called Louvciennes. And my mother had never seen this photograph of herself. In fact, she'd never seen a photograph of herself at that age at all. But my cousin recognized her because she had the um, almond shaped eyes and there were the twins were both there. And the lady who's on the right, the older, the older girl, she was actually only 16 in this picture. She is the one who wrote this book that we found. And it's called, in French, I'll translate it into English, I Will Never Forget You, My Children of Auschwitz. And in her book, 
she writes that all the children in this photograph were murdered at Auschwitz and she had no idea that my mother was still alive. So my mother's twin sister was murdered at Auschwitz and so were all the children in this photograph, except for my mother. And my mum went to meet her, this woman, after 62 years apart. And this was the inspiration for me to write this book. It was the fact that there was someone alive who knew what had happened to my mum and could answer our questions. Um, and also it was just like a, a door opening where I felt I could at last ask questions um, of my mum, although she, she really remembered almost nothing um, at all. Um, but I started to do my research from that moment. So this was most definitely the inspiration behind my book. And my research involved going to France and meeting this lady myself, who's now well into her 90s and um, still alive today, whereas my mother died 10, 11 years ago now. And really, it was only after she died that I felt I could write this book because I just thought it would be too upsetting for her. So um, I started writing it five or six years ago. And so she never, as I, uh, she never saw me achieve my ambition of becoming a published author. Um, but lots of friends and family, and you know, do reassure me that she would that she would be very proud. So it's very personal to me. Um, I have to say, I did change the names um, in the book of my family members. It just made it easier for me to to write. Um, and I write it as an adventure story because. Um, my two uncles who also survived had great adventures. One was um, running away from one children's home and, and um, you know, trying to cross the border into Switzerland. And he met Marcel Marceau, who I hope some of you have heard of. Um, he was doing mime at the time to help the, the Jewish children um, cross the border. And my other uncle joined the resistance. So there's all these three stories um, which I bring together in my book. I have no idea how long I've been talking for. Shall I stop now? <laughs> and over to Poppy, thank you. Oh gosh, that photo is just heartbreaking, Deborah. Oh, I can't wait to read your book. Right, something quite different now. Um, so the photo that uh, inspired the post office girls is quite, quite different um, and really quite appropriately, given that it's a story about the postal service, it's a postage stamp. I just love this stamp. I don't know why. There was something about it that just really captured my imagination. Um, so this, this stamp actually came out a few years ago, and it was part um, of a series of quite different stamps um, that marked the centenary of, of World War I. There was loads of stuff, wasn't there, a few years ago to mark 100 years since the, the Great War. Um, and I'd never heard of the Home Depot. Uh, I suppose, why would I have done? So I did a little bit of Googling and I discovered that it was this massive great wooden structure that had been um, flung up really quickly on the Regent's Park in London to deal with all the posts going to and from the various fronts. And as things sometimes do, it really captured my imagination for, well, for a couple of reasons, really. The first was that uh, I used to work in an advertising agency at the top of Great Portland Street, so right by the Regent's Park and we used to go there any sunny afternoon and we explored the whole place um, and obviously there's nothing like this massive great five acre wooden, wooden depot there anymore so I couldn't quite picture where it was and I was just fascinated to find out more um, and the second reason was because my grandfather um, ran part of one of the big sorting offices in London um, for the whole of his career um, so I'd grown up sort of hearing stories um, about the post office and I had loads of pen friends growing up and the post office was all, all really exciting, but he didn't work for the post office uh, during World War One because he was out front fighting in France. Um, and uh, like your mother, Deborah, he, he never ever spoke about it. So we, we vaguely knew that granddad back in the midst of time had, uh, um, had fought in the war, but he never ever talked about it. Um, and then when he, died I was a teenager I think my dad said as he died he was straight back in the trenches dug you know ducking from the shells so again it was something that has stayed with him suppressed all his life so I've always 
been slightly fascinated with World War One, and it's the whole idea of, I guess, ordinary people living through extraordinary times, isn't it? And you know, how would we cope and what would we do? Anyway, so I did more Googling, found out more about the Home Depot and um, yeah, got more and more fascinated by it and how much money the army, the army and the government had thrown into it because at that point they, well. He was, Kathy. Oh, sorry. Um, maintaining good communications between um, families and their, their relatives at the front was, as somebody quoted, was almost as important as getting food out there and getting munitions out there because it was all about maintaining morale. Um, so they sunk so much money into this Home Depot. And uh, as the war went on, more and more men from um, the post office and from the army went out to fight. So the place became um, staffed by women. Um, and at its height, there were, I think, 5,000 people working in the Home Depot and, you know, well over half of them were women doing all sorts of jobs. And some of the jobs I thought were kind of fascinating and, and, and heartbreaking. So um, there was a lot of, as well as the sorting, there was lots of censoring going on. Um, there was a returned letters department. So uh, when a soldier died, any letters that had been um, sent to him were returned to sender, marked, killed in action. Um, but obviously you didn't want that letter to, to get back before the telegram announcing the death had been received. So there was a whole department within the Home Depot holding on to these letters. It didn't always work. So sometimes some poor sod found out that their loved one had been killed by this letter coming back to them. So there was the returned letter department. There was the honour letter department. So um, any letter that a soldier sent back um, to Blighty was censored by his commanding officer. Um, but obviously you knew your commanding officer pretty well and sometimes there was stuff you just didn't want him to, to see. So you could apply for an honour envelope. They were green and uh, by getting one of those, your commanding officer didn't look at it, but you were promising that there was nothing in the letter that would um, compromise the war effort or do anything to, um, to damage war morale. So you couldn't go on about how dreadful the conditions were out there. Um, and even though the letter wasn't um, centred by your commanding officer, it was centred by somebody at the Home Depot. So again, they might redact it or they might just not send it on at all. So somebody had the heartbreaking job of reading through all these letters. Um, and there was a broken parcels department, which I will come on to talk about um, in the next little section, because that's the photo that actually inspired a lot of the setting and the plot of, of my story. So there you go, a little bit about what went on in the um, in the Home Depot. And shall I hand back to you, Molly, to tell us a little bit about the inspiration for, for your book? Yes. Um, so my inspiration, um, I lived in Moscow for six years in the 1990s. And while I was there, I so I was working for a courier service while I was there. And I also purchased um, several pieces of art. So a, a couple of paintings and some sculptures. Uh, at the time, the art was very inexpensive and it was just something I enjoyed doing. Um, and one of the paintings that I bought is, is this one. It's called Bird Girl. And it's painted by a woman named uh, Ludmila Mikhailovna Skibneva. And it was painted in 1977. Um, and I didn't know anything about this artist when, when I bought the painting in, uh, in 99 is when I bought it. Um, and shortly after I bought it, I moved away from Russia and we moved around quite a bit. So it, it went all over Africa and finally came back here. It was always hanging in our house and 15 years after I bought this painting, I was Googling around to try to get some information about the artist. I was just curious as to who she was. And um, I happened to learn that she, uh, I, I came across her, uh, a little bio about her online. And it turned out she had survived the siege of Leningrad as a small child and she's still alive and painting today. And 
so I started thinking about this woman and the the historic times and and all the changes she would have seen in in the Soviet times and and in Russia and I just started thinking about how all these changes and different things happening in the country, how, how it would have impacted her life and, and her family. And, um, and I looked at the painting a little bit differently. You know, I started to wonder who this girl was and, and uh, I just had lots of questions. And at the time I was doing a beginner's creative writing class at a, a local adult education college. So I, I, I was just doing it for fun. I didn't, you know, expect to write a novel or anything like this. Um, but the more I thought about it, the more I realized that it would make a really good story. Um, so I took just a few facts from her life. I took probably four facts from her life and I created the story um, that is the novel. Uh, so, so it's interesting that we all have sort of different inspiration points for our book. You know, some of them are very, very personal and linked to family. Um, mine are definitely linked to my experiences in Russia. The book isn't about my experiences there, but I never could have written this book without having lived there in the 90s. Um, you know, the idea never would have come to me. Um, and I think the other thing that really strikes me between all of these books is they are all about how big historical events impact ordinary people. Um, none of us are writing about famous people. We're talking about ordinary people. And I think this is where historical fiction has a really big role to play in creating these lives. And it's not just about the leadership of a country, but it's how uh, these events impact ordinary people. And I think this is part of what makes uh, historical fiction just wonderful, because you, you can go to a, a, a different time, a different place that maybe you haven't thought about. And, and also, you can see uh, a connection between that place and perhaps the experience in your own country. Um, so with this, we thought we would talk a little bit about characters, um, because some of our characters are inspired by real people. Um, so Quay Mai, can you tell us a little bit uh, about how, uh, how your characters were inspired? Thanks so much, Molly. Um, so uh, this is a picture uh, of my mom and I um, when I was growing up in the south of Vietnam. So this was the first opportunity ever that uh, I had a chance for a picture. Before that, uh, you know, we had no, no access to camera or my parents couldn't afford, you know, to have a photographer to take our pictures. So my parents were both teachers and farmers. And um, so, you know, I wanted uh, growing up, both of my grandmothers had died. So I was really jealous of my friends who had grandmothers to tell them stories and legends of our village. So I told myself one day I would write um, a novel with a grandmother in it so I would have a grandma. So, um, so you know, the Mountain Sing document is my imagination of how, of, of life, how life was for one of my grandmothers who perished with, together with 2 million other Vietnamese in the great hunger of Vietnam. So the great hunger is um, a result of World War II um, under the French uh, occupation in the Japanese invasion of Vietnam, 2 million Vietnamese people lost their lives, but so little has been written about it. So I interviewed a lot of people, elderly people, to be able to, to imagine this event. And um, my grandma, you know, my father told me heartbreaking circumstances of, my, uh, of her mother's death. So um, during the great hunger, um, you know, they were starving and my father and, and his sister didn't have anything to eat. So their mother, um, you know, ventured into a cornfield and she tried to steal some corn for my father and his sister. 
and the the guard in the in the field um he caught her and tied her to the corn plant and she hadn't eaten for days so she was really weak so she couldn't pass um she couldn't you know break away so she died on a corn field so you know i i I, I wanted to write a novel, you know, to, to take revenge. I wanted, you know, with the fiction, I wanted to do a lot of bad things to him. But in the end, you know, you'll find out that I find forgiveness instead. So because I didn't have a grandmother, so, um, you know, the, in, the characters of Grandma Ziolan in the mountain scene is very much inspired by the characteristics of my mom. So my mom is an orphan from a very young age, but recently my, my husband asked me who laughs most in your family. And then he told me it's your mother. You know, she has the most carefree laugh. She went through a lot of things. You know, she went through the great hunger, the land reform, the Vietnam war, and she lost so many family members, but she's always very uh, hopeful. And, you know, she always believes in the goodness of people. And she loves Vietnamese proverbs. So, you know, so I, I have Vietnamese proverbs in, in the novel, uh, you know, the proverbs that I use, often used by her. For example, you know, if I had a bad day and I come home and I complain and she would say, ah, trong cái rủi có cái may. Good luck hides inside bad luck. Um, you know, so that's a very common proverb that we say in Vietnam. And, uh, you know, it reminds us to make the most out of our situation. And when I was growing up, my two uh, brothers and I were quite naughty sometimes. And my father would lose his patience. And my mother would say, ah, mưa dầm thấm lâu. Soft and persistent rain penetrates the earth better than a storm. So upon hearing the proverb, my father would be reminded of the value of patience. So he would be more patient with us. So again, this proverb is widely used in Vietnam as well. And in Vietnam, we speak in proverbs. And my mom helps me a lot, uh, you know, in, in fictionalizing, um, you know, the stories I wanted to tell uh, into the mountains scene. Thank you. And how about you, Deborah? Uh, you know, um, what what are your inspirations for 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 your main character in in your novel? So my my inspiration is is my mum and here's another photo of my mum and her of her twin sister. Um, I think they I don't know how old they are here. Um, this was this is was another photo that we found quite late on. Um, obviously they were very young and in fact my mother's twin sister was six when she was murdered sent to the gas chambers of Auschwitz so obviously they they were very young but before I go back to that keep Quay Mai there's the, I'm making notes when you're speaking because there were so many similarities to think you know you've written uh, about a completely different country and I just made so first of all your mother was an orphan my mother was also an orphan orphaned at the age of four um, I, I didn't have any grandparents, sorry, I did have my, fa my father's parents, but I, my mother's parents, my grandparents on my mother's side as well, they were murdered, you know, 1942, so I, I never had that set of grandparents. You talked about the French invasion uh, in World War II, and, and my book's about the German invasion of France in World War II, um, and you said that your that um, your character la or your mother laughed a lot. Yeah. You're, so my mother also. I mean, you know, people people who knew her. Um, as I said, she she died eleven years ago. But people who knew her never had a clue what she went through um, because she always seemed so happy, and she never spoke about it. And when she died, her we we read something at the funeral about her life and people, friends that she'd known for years, they were just absolutely amazed at what she'd gone through. They had no idea. Um, so so that's that's really incredible. Uh, a lot of coincidences there about completely different stories. But yes, yeah, so so my mum and my and her twin. Um, you know when I. So as I said, I, I wrote my book through the through the eyes of three different from di three different points of view. My mother and 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 two of her brothers, although the names are changed, 
Um, so for my mother, it was because she never spoke about it. And I wrote this book after she died and I had, I couldn't, you know, ask her questions. I just had to put myself in, in try and put myself in, in her, in her head, if you like. And um, how would it have felt to be the surviving twin? to have your twin sister murdered at six years old and you are the one who survives. I mean, it must have ju just been the most incredible burden to carry with you your whole life and carry hidden. Um, and I did some research into twins because obviously there is that special bond. And uh, it's just, you know, it was just heartbreaking when I was doing it. Um, it must have been just just awful and it's hardly surprising that she never she never spoke about it and um that is one of the reasons that i that i wrote the book and i also give talks to school children about her life and the lives of um, her family and i think someone wrote on the chat that they've that they've listened to my talk because i want people to know it's so important and also we spoke about telling stories through individuals rather than so yes I can say six million Jews were murdered in the Holocaust 76,000 Jews were murdered in France which I think a lot of people don't know about they know about um, Germany and Poland but France isn't often thought about but I think it's so much more powerful to just look at one family and tell their story and three characters in particular and one and you know as the author to be writing about my own mother and then to actually be able to give you know facts about what actually happened and have some photographs now and everything um I just want people to know what happened and I try and um teach young people about the dangers of anti-semitism and racism and hatred and teach them to be kind to people who are different to the to them and um and that's all I can do really and it's become a bit of a vocation for me now so um 10 years ago I I also never spoke about the holocaust and and now it's 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 really what I do all the time because I'm giving these talks and I also work for a charity called the Association of Jewish Refugees and we we are the national charity who look after holocaust survivors in the UK and I write their life stories. So, um, so that's really become my life's work now. And I see it as people say, is it a burden or is it, or is it a, a privilege, an honour? And, and it's definitely an honour. I'm honouring their memory and that's, and that's all I can do. But uh, yeah, the story's, the story's all in my book. So I hope people will read it and, um, and tell others, you know, about the dangers that... Uh, that happened not that long ago, really, um, and and keep telling their stories, keep their stories alive. So, Poppy, over to you. Sorry, I keep leaving Thank you on a downer. <laughs> no, no, that's fine. A time for something quite different. Um, I don't know how we're doing for time, so um, I'll speed up and something quite different again. So, my photo that inspired a character um, isn't a picture of of an individual really, or, or definitely not a relative. So this is a photo that I stumbled across um, of a group of women uh, working together in the broken parcels department of the Home Depot. I think there are about hundred people working in it. Um, and I've, I've relied quite heavily on it and on photos like it in writing the Post Office Girls because there, there isn't actually a lot of written stuff around as to actually what happened there. The whole thing was dismantled. Uh, a couple of years after the war, I think in about 1921, and uh, people who have tried to write histories of what happened in the great parks during the war all agree that there's just there's just not much left. Um, but I, lo I love this photo, and I, as I say, I've relied on it for things like uh, what they wore. Was it a uniform? Kind of a uniform, but not really. Um, what the interior of the Home Depot was like, and I imagine it was boiling in in summer and really cold in winter and I love the Union Jack on the wall and uh, I couldn't really find out much information about what packaging materials they use so I was quite pleased to see there's a pot of glue, glue on the table there um, which may gave me a clue um, so all in all it lots of inspiration for all, all three of my characters start working off in the broken, broken parcels department um, 
And uh, the only other thing I really had to go on, there's a great book in the um, in the Postal Museum. Because the other trouble I've had, I don't know if we, we've all had it, is because of um, because of the lockdown and because of COVID, all the museums are shut and all the libraries are shut. So um, it's been quite hard to, to, to do some of the research. And I'm hugely indebted to so many people who, when I said I can't get into the Postal Museum, gave up so much time just to tell me about their own research and... Uh, that's been absolutely fabulous. So the only other thing was a great big book that lists all the women that worked there and their names and their addresses and how old they were and their marital status. Uh, if they got up to any misdemeanours, and they didn't really, they were all very good when they were on duty. They were just a bit late sometimes or didn't come in at all. Um, and any accidents that occurred. And again, Paper cuts seem to be the main thing, but really bad paper cuts from the letters requiring stitches um, and lots of injuries because these women were having to sling around really, really heavy sacks and, and, and bags. Um, and there seemed to be a lot of broken parcels to, to fix. And I think it was both because of the things that people were actually sending um, and because a lot of people just didn't have the money or the access to the right type of, of packaging materials. Um, and because well, not all the fronts, but certainly the fronts in France are, are actually really quite close in terms of miles. And because the post was, was so quick um, in those days, you could post something to your relative in the front um, from anywhere in, in Britain and, and hope that if it didn't get there that day, it would certainly get there by the next morning. Um, and so people were sending all sorts of perishables. Um, and I was reading some of the letters from, from, from people that were sent home from the front. So it was very common for um, a mum or a wife to make a batch of cakes and you'd pop a couple in the post for Tommy at the front so that he could share in what the family were eating. And quite a few examples of people who actually <laughs> packed up a whole portion of a, of a roast dinner, gravy and all, and sent that out again so that your relative could share the, uh, the experience of eating with the family. Um, and there seem to be quite a lot of uh, roast dinners that are being repackaged in the broken parcels department because they've because they've oozed out. Um, and there was a quote I found that they were saying how lovely it was. There was a whole department patching up the derelict comforts and sending them on the way. Um, and the sorts of things that you could send out there were um, were amazing. You could send matches, and there were there were more than one fire um, reported because of the matches in these in these parcels. Um, and also you couldn't send some varieties of alcohol, but you could send out uh, cocaine and morphine and heroin. And some of the um, department stores, Harrods, I think it was, had a beautifully presented little, little pack with, with these drugs in it, together with um, syringes and needles called um, a, welcome, a welcome gift for friends at the front. So that was just waved on its way. I think later in the war that was stopped. Um, because of the effect on the troops, but certainly in 1915, when I'm writing this book, uh, you could send you could send all that through. So yes, one little photo just really kind of gave me a setting, gave me three girls. That girl on on the left there is my inspiration for for Millie in the book. That's the one, um, and gave me ideas for the plot as well. So over to you, Molly. Would you like to tell us? about the inspiration behind one of your characters. Yes, I'll be brief so that we can get to some of these questions. Um, so, you know, it's interesting because I think with Deborah and Koi Mai's book, there's this kind of setting the record straight, you know, uh, you wanted to get revenge, but to, to put down uh, a different perspective than what people think about when they think about a time period. And for me, that was very much what I wanted to do about the 1990s, because I think most people, they think the collapse of the Soviet Union, hurrah, it was great for everybody. And, you know, nothing's ever that simple. Um, when, when the Soviet Union collapsed, uh, it was good news for some people and they did very well. And it was bad news for, for other people who really struggled to make the transition into the, the, the new economy. And especially for an older generation, you know, to completely rewrite the rules on how life is lived. Um, some people really struggled to make this transition. Um, so again, uh, similar to what um, 
I think it was Deborah was saying that you were really mindful that you wanted it to be accurate. And um, especially when you're, I was writing about a culture, I'm not Russian, um, I'm, I'm not an expert in Russian history. So it was very important to me to, um, to make it authentic, uh, as authentic as I could. And um, especially in the 90s section, I drew quite a bit on people that I actually knew. And in this case, this man, he, is, he was one of my colleagues when I was working at Pony Express, which is a courier service. Um, Pony Express features in the book. And I started with a character, and I actually did use his first name, Eager, and he is Eager. Um, and he's a wonderful, wonderful person who, who's a typical computer programmer kind of person. Um, but in my book, Eager becomes actually quite an evil character, um, which when I started writing, I, I don't plan at all. So um, when he became a baddie, uh, I was surprised. I was surprised as anybody because he's, he's the least bad person that, that you could ever find. Um, but Eager, he still works at Pony Express. He's still in, in charge of the computer programming. Um, but it, it started with him, but it, uh, it, it veered away from him very quickly. Um, so I think it's interesting how we've all drawn on different uh, real events to create our fiction. In, in my book as well, when I was doing the research, I, I, through reading nonfiction, I found most of the plot points that are in my book are real things that actually happen. Um, so you just kind of find a way to weave it into the story. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna take off the screen share, and we can see if we have any questions. Um, I don't think there's any questions unless they're in the chat. Uh, I think they're mainly just comments. People yeah, agreeing with us. <laughs> That's good to hear. <laughs> oh, good. You've been going through them then. Um, were there any questions then that? people have uh, while we're waiting molly i have to tell you the funniest thing so you know we have this uh, like auto uh, transcript at the bottom and when you were saying the name of the artist i wrote down what it trans how it transcribed to let me kind of nuts <laughs> that was ludmila mikhailovna skivneva <laughs> Which really tickled me. I thought that was excellent. So. Okay, we have some questions coming in. The first one is, how do you know when to stop researching the time period? So for me, personally, I was very much researching as I was writing. And I also did an MA in creative writing. So I was learning to write while I was writing the book. Um, my book two uh it was lots of reading but it's not like the research is done i start writing i'm sure i'll have to carry on and for me personally i um I, you know you read loads and loads and loads and probably five percent or ten percent goes into the book most of it is just creating um background information sort of atmosphere for your for your own mind um, what what about you, Kwemai? How about your research process? Um, so so actually, like like you said, you know, Molly, uh, that uh, as fict um, in writing historical fiction, we do a lot of real life research. Uh, but that research is like a garden for us to grow a tree, right? So we only use a small percentage of our uh, actual materials that we feed into the novel, but that um, the thorough research is so impor important because it builds the garden for all the nutrients, you know, for our tree to grow for us, for it to, gr to give fruits and flowers. So um, uh, when do I stop uh, researching? I think I never stop. I, ne I keep, uh, you know, like 
like you said, I also research when I write. I mean, I do a lot of researching before, but doing the writing, you, 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 you are forced to inquire more, you know, into uh, into the things you're writing about. So, so I keep doing it until the last minute. So it's my editors who said, "Okay, stop correcting or stop editing." You know, it's enough now. Yeah. now. Um, but I think it's the researching part is fascinating because it's a learning, right? We all love the things we write about. So we are fascinated. We want to learn more. So how about you, Deborah? Uh, yeah, is- I mean, yeah, so, sorry. So, you know, part of the reason that I wrote this book or I wrote it after I wanted to piece together the first nine years of my mother's life. Okay, so um there is one year when she was a hidden child in a convent with uh, nuns. They hid her and she was by herself. I mean, no one else. I, ha- I don't know anybody else who was with her during that one year. And that the whole thing is a complete mystery still. So I'm still researching. I want to know where she was during that year. Um, and it's very, very early. It's been impossible for me to find out because it was a it was a red. It was a. I don't know if it was a Red Cross, but anyway, it was a hidden, it was a secret operation. And it was, it was so secret that it's been impossible for me to find out. And I have, oh my gosh, I mean, the Nazis were just like meticulous list writers. I mean, there is so much information out there. I've, my cousin went to the Holocaust Museum in Washington and gave our family names. And I think he got over 400 documents come up. I mean, there's just loads and loads of things. But there's a whole year of her life that I don't, nobody knows anything about. So that's, that's what I'm still researching. So I will, I will not fit be finished until I found that out. But yeah, I mean, you, you really have to do something. It has to be a subject that you're very passionate about, I think, because it can really take over. So. Um, now I'm afraid we have to wrap things up because they're asking us to, um, to finish things. If you have more questions, um, I'll put in a hashtag, um, ripple through time. Um, And you can find us either on Twitter or on Instagram where we're all there. We're happy to take any of your questions. Somebody asked for the artist and I've put her name into the the chat. And, um, And yeah. I think, oh, I didn't send it to everybody. That's the thing. I, I've seen it. You, somebody did. That's a really good idea with the hashtag, Molly. Well done. I'll yeah. look out for it. Yeah, definitely. Great idea. Brilliant. And so it was a great session. And thank you so much. Brilliant books. I'm looking forward to reading Post Office Girls. I absolutely love the other two books. Um, so thank you very much to everybody for joining us today. It, it was great. And thank you to the Stay at Home Fest for. for yes, thank you. yes, thank you so much, guys. It's been brilliant. Thank you. It's gone so thank you. I want to do it again. I know. <laughs> Let's just stay on, shall we? Yeah. <laughs> no, we